I am now joined by Ewan Burns to talk through the latest Serie A Feminile action. And as it tends to be, it was full of goals again this weekend. And I'm just going to start by, by running through the, the results. Ewan, I should actually say hello to you. Thanks, thanks for taking the time to come on and talk to us again this week. <laughs> No problem at all. Um, so obviously, Milan went away to Lazio on, on Saturday and won 8 1. Yes, 8 1. Sassuolo beat Sampdoria 2 0. I was in Sassuolo at the Enzo Ricci for that. So I'm sure we'll have a little bit of a chat about that one. Roma beat Pomigliano 2 1. Juventus beat LS Verona 3 0. Inter beat Empoli 4 1. And probably the, the biggest standout result of the round was Napoli beating Fiorentina 1 0. So where shall we start? I think it's probably right to, to go to Milan. They are top of the league now. Them, Juve, Roma, Inter and Sassuolo all have maximum points from their three games so far. But this, away to newly promoted Lazio, was as much of a statement win you and as you could possibly imagine. Yeah, it, it didn't look like two teams in the same division. It was a, like, you know, there's a battering and then there's this game. Because straight from the off, I think, I think the first goal was after like four minutes and they'd already had a very good chance before that. Um, Valentina Giacinti just was just the biggest problem. <laughs> like, I don't know how she... There's a lot of things with this, with this result where you have to weigh it up against the fact that Lazio really weren't very good. So either she is the best player in the world at finding space <laughs> or it's just the leakiest, most gappiest defence you've ever seen because she was just on her own in the box all the time. She missed two or three sitters as well as scoring four goals. Um, she was linking up with Lindsay Thomas in the most delightful way. They were just jinking through people. They had Bergamaski behind them, which was really good as well. Um, she just sort of would feed it to the two of them and then they'd muck about for a bit and then score a goal. That was more or less how the first half went. Um, but she, you know, she scored four goals and she she only played just under an hour. You know, she she got taken off and um, Lindsay Thomas got taken off quite soon after as well, only about ten minutes later. So it was just Lazio do not look like a team that are going to stay up. Obviously, they have only just come up, so it is probably fair enough that they've not shown anything so far that would make you think that they're going to stay in the division. And Milan, based on this performance, do look like a team generally capable of, you know. It feels daft to say win every game, but yeah. as we've said, that is what it takes. <laughs> and they, you know, at the moment, they look like they could do that. It basically comes down to the games against Sassuolo and Juve, right? That's what we're thinking from these early rounds, anyway. Certainly, what I am, I would be including Sassuolo in that. But Jacinti is, she's a stupid footballer, but she's she must be a nightmare to to play with as well, because you see, they I can't remember which game it was this season. Um, let me just take a quick look. I think it was their first game of the season because she didn't score a hat-trick, did she? No, she scored twice. It was the 4-0 win over Alas Verona. She scored twice. And at 4-0, she was going mad at her teammates because she hadn't scored her hat-trick yet. And it's just, she feeds off goals. And she is so intelligent at finding these spaces as well. And she does miss quite a lot of chances. But she's just a headache for everyone else on the pitch her teammates included and I mean that in the best possible way she's just a moan and it must be a nightmare to be up against her or to be playing with her but one of those players who at the same time as you know you're going to get an earful if you misplace a pass you know that more often than not she's going to put away a chance if you create it and you know she's going to create a lot of chances just by finding space but Lindsay Thomas as well was also on the score sheet she got two and she's just taken to, to life at Milan seamlessly as well. Yeah, definitely. She, she's she got this interesting dribbling style. Every now and then you get these players who you sort of watch them run with the ball and you think, oh, you're, you're not going very quickly. You're going to get caught up soon. But no one gets near them. <laughs> I always remember the, the player who always sticks in my head whenever I say that is Dimitar Berbatov in the men's game. He used to be like that. He, he'd sort of cruise through the middle of the pitch and you'd think, he's just going to get tackled in a minute and he just wouldn't people just bounce off him and Lindsay Thomas got that same feeling about her and the the finishing seems to be coming into her game a lot more now she struggled for goals last year at Rome she was always dangerous but she didn't score many goals but she, you know she seems to have sorted that out and you know, look like they've 
got another really good forward on the pitch. Yeah, they they really do, and that that partnership, what they've got there with Toma and Giacinti, Sassuolo have with Sofia Cantore and Lana Cleland, and like I said, I was I was there my first ever time going to Sassuolo the place. This weekend, I've been to Sassuolo's new home, the Mape, of course, too many, a lot more times than I would like to have been there, to be perfectly honest with you. But Sassuolo as a town is lovely. I was I was very surprised in the province of Modena. It's, it was quite complicated to get to, but partially because Trenitalia just decided to not run their trains between Parma and, and Reggio Emilia, which added an extra 45 minutes onto my trip, which was not great. Um Multiplying the the train journey by by three, their fifteen minute trip to Reggio turned into. A I was going to say it's not far, is it, on the map? When, when no, <laughs> no. But the the way when they have the substitute buses, um, but that's not correct in English, is it? Re- the replacement buses, uh, um, substitute yeah, ones, rail, rail replacement. We call yeah, <laughs> the the rail replacement buses go to the little side streets rather than just going on the motorway. And doing it in 20 minutes, they they go through all of the little villages like Santilario. And there's just no point going there because no one gets on or off. But anyway, no one cares about that. Sassuolo is a lovely place. And Sassuolo have a really, really enjoyable team. And I, I said this in a tweet, but I, I want to bring it up again. Because if you're listening to this podcast and you do not have an Italian football team that you have pinned all of your love to, make it Sassuolo. Because across the board... This club are just doing things the right way. Their women's team are brilliant. Their men's team are brilliant. The way the club is run is second, probably only to Atalanta in in Serie A. And if if I didn't have a team now, I'd be buying all of the Sassuolo gear because they're doing things right. One of the big bugbears I have with Atalanta is that they created the women's team and then disbanded it after, I think, one year. But Sassuolo... They, they look like the real deal. Lana Cleland, I'm going to talk about her because I wrote about her and I don't think there's a player that I love more at the moment than, than Lana Cleland, but her partnership with Cantore is, is ridiculous, Ewan. And, and if Giacinti and Tomà can, can give Milan reasons to believe in a title, then Cantore and Cleland can do the exact same for Sassuolo. Yeah, definitely. We, yeah, we've, we've already talked about narrowed down our title hopefuls to a specific set of teams and you know the easiest way to judge teams is by their goal scorers and both those teams have got such clear brilliant partnerships up front that are going to score you know to to, to overturn this Juventus team you need at least two players to be in double figures um, and preferably a few more players chipping in very regularly Um, and Milan as well have that Juve have got it tenfold with who will come on to and then Roma and Inter, the other teams we've had in there, and they they seem more more like teams that share the goals around. Obviously, they have got individuals like uh, Gloria Marin Elliott, uh, Inter, Serterini, and probably say Gliana. Probably um, Roma seem to stand out as goal scorers, but it's a bit more spread through the midfield as well for them. Um, but yes, as well, they're just look dangerous all the time. They're constantly dangerous, but they're the sort of not in a chaotic way. I feel like they're quite silky. <laughs> yeah, they're quite smooth in the way that they batter teams. Yeah, they they're quite suffocating. They when they have the ball, you do think that right. The only way Sampdoria get the ball back is if Sassuolo score and they get kick off or they miss a shot because every move they they build looks like it's going to end in a shot. And then you've got Cleland and Cantore who don't need to speak but just understand each other. And the movement from Cleland in particular is just, it's ridiculous. I mean, I'd encourage everyone to, to go over to, to ForzaItalianFootball.com and read what I wrote from, from the Enzo Ricci about Cleland because I must have spent a good hour of that 90 minutes just watching her and Cantore just to see what they were up to. And Cleland is the type of player that you want to have player cam back for you know that option on sky back in the day where you could go in and just watch a player i was effectively doing that and i've no regrets i'm gonna go back to sassuolo this season probably multiple times and just continue to do that because she's a joy (laughs) to watch her her movements insane she has this way of playing passes that even from the stands you don't see 
And I, I don't know how she can spot these things. I, I said in my thing that it's like she's got a drone hovering 50 meters above the pitch and she's connected up to some camera in that because the movements oh, she's able to spot. spot <laughs> yeah. She, yeah. She plays these like first time no look passes just with the outside of her foot that go around three defenders. And it's, it's crazy. And Cantora has obviously got the pace that allows her to play balls into space that Cantore can, can then get onto. And the two of them together are just terrifying, absolutely terrifying. But Sampdoria, to their credit, they didn't actually look bad. And it would have been quite easy to look bad against this Sassuolo team, but they stood relatively firm. They were pretty dangerous on the counter-attack, probably more so in the first half. Um, Stefania Terenzi was, was lively. She was trying to do pretty much everything. And if she wasn't, or even when she was the one starting the attacks, when they got into the final third, they were quite obviously looking for her as the reference point to then try to finish them as well. And she came close a couple of times. They had a goal ruled out for what looked to be a very, very narrow offside. And that was still at nil-nil. So who knows what would have happened then? Although being there, I got the impression that it would have just poked the beast, to be honest. And I think Sassuolo <laughs> might have might have hit four or five had Sampdoria opened the scoring. But Sassuolo very, very much like the re- look like the real deal. And I'm impressed and excited to see what they can do this season. Last season, obviously, there was a, a record-breaking campaign for them. They Points total, finished third for the first time. And it looks like they can go one further again this year. And fingers crossed, I'm definitely putting my backing behind them. They are firmly my Feminile team this season. Last season, I kind of floated between Roma and Fiorentina, but this season, I'm, I'm very much on board the Nero Verde, um, mostly because I can go to their games and visit Sassuolo, to be honest. Um, anyway, Juventus just kept doing what Juventus do. They, they beat Alas Verona 3-0. Uh, Cristiana Girelli scored twice, and Valentina Cernoia, again for the second week in a row, scored Juventus's third. You and you very, you very. Yeah, this is one of their more understated wins, but I think they deserve zero credit credit for it because they're wearing their away kit at home, which is bad. All right, wrong. Kev. I didn't realize Kev was showing up on the <laughs> Feminile pod. What's happened there? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite as angry about kits as Kev is, but away kits at home, what for marketing purposes, winds me up because <laughs> it just confuses you when you're watching the highlights. Um, but yeah, they. They just looked completely calm. Hellas Verona seemed to do a decent job for a while at keeping them at bay. I was quite surprised it took as long as it did for you to score once they did. Um, you know, like you say, those two Girelli headers were both very, very good. And Valentina Chinoy seems like the perfect player to back up the Juve strike force. She chips in at a perfect amount and she sets up an incredible amount of goals. I, I know she set up at least one of Jerry's headers, it may have been the other one as well. I think they're both from corners. Um, so yeah, they they've just got so many tools to hurt a team. You know, they can afford to have a player like one and say and not score, not do a great deal during the game, and it's fine because they've got other quality players who will just pick up slack. Mm. And Bonasse is one of those as well, right? She she doesn't need to do anything because you know she's gonna score about 15, 20 goals this season. <laughs> <laughs> she can just yeah. stand about and put them away when she really, really needs to. Like the goals she got against Fiorentina last week were were important particularly the timing of them. Against Alas Verona, she doesn't really need to score. If she pops up in the game yeah. where they're struggling, that'll that'll do for Juve. But um, you said you're not as angry as Kev about kits. You were also moaning about the the Milan, the Lazio Milan kit situation, weren't you? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, that was weird though. Because like why stick them in white against Lazio's incredibly light blue? Yeah. <laughs> like they, they they have black shorts on to me that didn't it wasn't enough to save it. Mm. <laughs> no, I agree. I thought that was farcical, to be honest. And it's, do you know what? It's really annoying because that Lazio Milan game was the the free to air game on La Seta here, right? And it just looked ridiculous. It looked dreadful. It mm. really looked bad. And it, it's it's something that the has just been a, a constant thing with Italian football, and that they don't help themselves when they're trying to sell themselves. The product just looks laughable sometimes and that was an example of it you've got a free to air game with with milan who have one of the best strike partnerships in in european football you could argue and they score eight goals but it was hard to watch because of the the kit decisions i don't know who in their mind gave that the green light but it was a stupid decision um 
more infuriating than the the Juve one I'm turning into Kev now um before we move on to talk about the other three games that were played this weekend we do have a question from one of our patrons and it's quite complimentary so we're going to be a little bit self-indulgent here right and I'm going to read through at you um it comes from Sonia says long time listener first time caller with a question your Serie A Feminile coverage has been great best English speaking source she has found by far her question is however for those getting into the league what three domestic and three international players should we be watching out for so I sent you this. I'll let you know a little bit before we record it. We've, we've both got three Italian players and three non-Italian players who we think will, will be worth watching for, for those of you who are new to Serie A Feminile. And I have a feeling that some of our players are going to overlap a little bit because we tend to, to talk about them quite often. But Ewan, can you just give me the list? Your, your three domestic players and then your three foreign players then I'll name mine and then we can have a little bit of a chat about them okay so my domestic players are Anna Maria Cesarini which is not a shock uh Valentina Chernoia who you already mentioned okay and Valentina Giacinti who you already mentioned (laughs) okay we've (laughs) we've only gone for one of the same there but I knew you were going to pick Cesarini so I deliberately left her out in in favor of someone else yeah there's one that I reckon in the nationals that you've got that I certainly could have included. I mean, there's lots of very good players. Mm. Um, and then international-wise, I've gone for Lindsay Tomer, who we've already mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> These players keep coming up. Um, Andrea Saskova from Juve, because I just think she's got quite an interesting trajectory going on with her career. And even more so trajectory-wise, Nina Kajba at AS Roma, because she is only 17 and is also already made a debut which I think Mm. says quite a lot yes it it does I'm just going to run through my players and then we will have a little bit of a chat so for the domestic players I've gone for uh, probably not that surprisingly Sofia Cantore because I think she's brilliant I thought she was brilliant with Florentia as well and now she's gone up a level playing with with Cleland Valentina Giacinti is the one player that we've we've overlapped with there and for my third, I wanted to do Anna Maria Sartorini, but I know that she is probably your favorite player in, in the league. So <laughs> I went for a different angle and I went for Eleonora Goldoni because she's okay. at Napoli. And I don't really know why, because she's probably better than that. And she's like an, a midfielder who gets quite a lot of goals and is very important to that team. For the overseas players, what a surprise. I've gone for Lana Cleland. <laughs> That's the top one. I love her. Andressa Alves from Roma because she's one of the most just she's a relaxing player to watch you know she never seems under pressure so I've gone for her and then Lindsay Thomas as well so we've from six we've both overlapped on two I think we did quite well there to, to spread it out but let's talk through it you, you mentioned the the Roma 17 year old and I think can we say can we not say? I think we can say, right? Yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got an exclusive an interview, another one, um, with Nina Kajba at Roma, which will be out later this week. Um, she, not only is she only 17, she's not even been 17 for that long. Um, her birthday's in April. And it, you know, as someone who I like to think of myself as relatively young, it didn't sit well with me interviewing somebody who is that much younger than me. But she, she's come from Slovenia. She only joined Roma this summer. And, um, and essentially, she didn't hide it herself when I asked her about it. The Slovenian league, despite her age, was just too easy for her. So she got 32 goals in 14 appearances in that league for her um, previous team. Can you just repeat those and numbers? She's already played in the Champions in League as well. Games. Um, last season, they were... Yes, 17 years of age, <laughs> um, which, you know, that, that's why she's been clearly fast-tracked to a better league. Um, and, you know, she, she's already played in the Champions League. They were one game away from getting through to play against Barcelona, which would have been pretty incredible for her. Um, and, you know, she, she's in a weird situation now where she's one of the only players in the Roma squad who have played in the Champions League. Um, but... She's just, she's one of them forwards where, like, obviously most forwards, they're either 
really good at dribbling, they're really good at finisher, they're really tall. She seems to have all of that. And it wasn't necessarily expected by um, by the sort of the, the, the few amounts of media that we can find for Serie for Milano coverage that she would be involved with the first team particularly quickly. But evidently she's impressed in training and she got she got the last quarter of an hour last weekend. She didn't come on this weekend. It was a slightly tight again, as we'll come on to later. But, you know, it looks like she's going to get a decent handful of minutes this season. I would not be at all surprised to see her pick up a goal or two. And, you know, if, if she really is the real deal, there's also, sadly, a real chance that she may not spend that long in the division. She may move on. Yeah, quite possibly. The people we've spoken to at Roma as well seem very excited about the talent yeah. she has. So she's definitely one to watch. Um, Jacinto, we've spoken about Cantore. We've spoken about Cleland, but Cantore is basically the, the perfect complement for, for Cleland because she's she's an amazing dribbler. She moves in possession a lot more than Cleland does, and she's rapid and just one of those that can explore space and, and find space very, very well as well. Goldoni, goal-scoring midfielder. But my favourite my favorite midfielder in, in Serie A Feminile is definitely Andressa because she's she never panics. She's just the calmest presence on the ball. And I remember watching her in the, the Coppa final and just thinking, like, she's, she's not playing this match. She's playing a different match that she has created in her head. And there's 21 players around her that just are irrelevant. When she has the ball, she does what she wants to do, when she wants to do it, and it always works out. I don't think she's ever misplaced a pass in her life, to be perfectly honest with you. And she's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. She did very well for Brazil at the Olympics in the summer as well, scored a stunning goal, which I would encourage you guys to check out. But watch Andressa. If Roma are playing and you can watch it on La Sette, which is, is free to, to air wherever you are in the world as well, by the way, just tune in and watch Andressa. She's a joy, an absolute joy. Lindsay Thomas, we've, we've spoken about you. And is there anyone else that you want to single out from your list and, and chat about a little bit? Well, um, if Roma fans will be very happy to hear, after you saying that about Andressa Elms, that on the other wing, you can have Anna Maria Cesarini, who is just the most she's probably with the way you describe Al she's probably the opposite sort of player in the sense that she's so involved and very very frantic but in, a, in an incredibly measured way she's so fast down the wing and she's she's really good at you know she's she's not one dimensional she's very good at cutting inside and she can easily beat a player on the outside and put in a very very nasty cross at the same time so that, that's what makes Roma a hell of a lot of fun to watch because they've got two deeply skillful players on either side of the pitch. Yeah, absolutely right. Back to the games then. Sonia, I hope that answers your question. I should say actually as well, if, if you do want to get questions in, head to patreon.com slash Forza Italian Football. Sign up for as little as two euro a month to get a little bit of extra content and priority for questions for the podcast. We also have five euro and 10 euro tiers and I would urge you, if you can afford it, the five euro tier is very much worth your while. Inter beat Empoli 4-1. I thought that's quite a big result because Inter were almost flirting with the relegation fight last year. They were a little bit above it, but they were almost down there. Rita Guarino's come in. They do look like they're a different team this year and you and they should be a little bit more comfortable come the end of this season. Yeah, I mean, as it stands, they, they don't look any worse than the teams that we're talking about to win the title. You know, whether they can sustain this remains to be seen, they probably can't. But like you say, this is a very, very different team to the one that did flirt with relegation last season. They've won, they've won all three games now and they've done it pretty comfortably as well. Um, Gloria Marinelli seems to be the, the danger person up top. They've got two or three other players who all seem to be capable of chipping in the goals. That was a couple of very, very nice goals against Empoli. Um, but this was a bit of a weird game because Empoli did actually miss two penalties. One of which was shocking. <laughs> it was just absolutely blazed over the bar, <laughs> which is I mean, possibly the worst way to miss a penalty. The other one was just slightly wide. It was a bit more fair enough. Um, I didn't quite catch if it was the same player or not. Um, 
the second one was right at the end, so it probably wouldn't have made a huge amount of difference to the result. But but yeah, into you know they're they're still right up there. They've won three games, so as far as they're concerned, they're doing the right thing. Another team who are doing the right thing are Napoli. They've they got their first win of the season, and they only won three games in the entirety of last term and stayed up with fourteen points. So. To get off the mark this early is, is huge. Ariana Acuti scored the winner in the 83rd minute against Fiorentina. And, I mean, Napoli were outplayed. Fiorentina did dominate that game, but both sides managed to get three shots on target. So it shows that Napoli, when they had the ball, they did a whole lot more with it than Fiorentina did. And I, I do think that this could be a season again where we see Napoli just about survive and then... Next summer, who knows? If, if they can keep hold of Goldoni and maybe bring in a couple of others, they, they can push on again. The last game, Pomigliano yeah. won Roma 2. You and we won't spend too long talking about it because we've spoken a lot about Roma via Sartorini, Andressa, and um, everyone else. But this was as convincing a 2 1 win as a 2 1 win could possibly be. They had 21 shots, 73% of the possession, and they, they only won 2 1. Yeah, and what what's quite interesting about this game is what the coach said afterwards. Um, he said that this this match will be useful for us in the future. And the most important thing is the nine points, obviously meaning getting to nine. They didn't get nine from the game, <laughs> um, but it did seem like the sort of game where you know as much as they were on top, they were vulnerable throughout in the sense that it was only a one goal lead for the last chunk of the game and if you want to really challenge towards the top of the table, you can't have a lapse in concentration and let that disappear from you. Pomigliano seem to be, obviously they are, of course, one of the lower teams in the division, but they do seem quite stubborn and they are capable of avoiding absolute batterings based on what they've done so far. Um, and that's that's the exact sort of game that you, you could easily have a lapse in concentration at the end and suddenly you only get one point. And as we've said, that could be fatal <laughs> title-wise in this campaign which is what's so daft about it because obviously with it being 12 teams as well like each win or defeat is kind of amplified in how we think of it in our heads because there's such a fewer amount of games that the end of the season rolls around a lot quicker yeah absolutely right and it links back to what we were saying I can't remember I don't think it was last week no it was last week we did the the special Feminile pod that the teams at the top if they don't win a match crisis good night season's over so th there is that extra jeopardy to all of this Ewan thank you very much for, for taking the time to come and join us as ever I know you're going to be meeting Kev during the week so all I can yeah. say is good luck with that <laughs> yeah I have to find find a bar that suits all three of us because it's, it's Kev and his wife who I've right. not spoken to before so I need, <laughs> need to be careful not to do that thing where you meet up with someone and just just talk about football to one person while there's somebody else there who might might want to talk about something else. <laughs> uh, Stace, is, Stace is much more pleasant than, than Kev is, so you'll be fine, don't oh, worry. <laughs> Whatever you talk about, she'll be happy to talk about it. Um, all right, we'll speak to you guys again soon. Goodbye.